gone from what I understand. Fuck. Off the site. Yeah. I noticed that for a while after uh, Kyrie like got really into Amazon documentaries, they were just like lowering the prices on his shoes on like Nike.com, almost like a Dutch auction where it goes to zero, but no one was buying them. Now, when, when you say they. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nike. But he definitely thought it was a different day. <laughs> All right, we're, we're getting into some weird territory here, guys. Yes. Um, hey, what's up, everybody? This is Nerzy, the official podcast of Kyrie Irving shoe owners who bought them due to their value and not the values associated with them. I am Drew Millard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Slava P. I'm Trey. I'm John. And this is Masterclass. Um, oh, fuck, oh wait, yeah. we, we, we have a soundboard now? Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah John is go. on it. <laughs> what else you got program in there? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see. Oh, we got a beer. Okay. Drinking a nice beer. What else? Mm. And then we, and then after we drink the beer, <clears throat> oh Slava, that's terrible. <laughs> oh my god, we got a lot of good stuff in here. That's enough for, for me for the whole show. <laughs> You're like an old timey radio sound effects guy. Like, do you yeah. have coconuts that you slap together to make horse hooves <laughs> sounds? He's a gaffer. I have a baba booey drop. <laughs> um. Can can we just start on a serious note? Uh, someone actually reached out and turned, and it turns out that scrometing is a real thing. Really? Yeah, it, it's called cannabinoid hyperesium syndrome, and it's when people ingest too much THC, they begin to like dry heave to the point where they get dehydrated and have to be checked into the hospital. Wow. Um... So you know, our deepest apologies to all of our scrometing. Uh, podcast listeners we're sorry okay but you didn't say anything about screaming or vomiting in there i guess like the dry like that's what so if you do go on the uh c so chs is what it's commonly known as and they have subreddits dedicated and the shorthand version that they use to describe their affliction is scrometing mm. Is it like a self-aware? Sorry, and I has an article about this, so let me go ahead and I'll check that out later. All right, well, you learn something new every day. Yeah. So, yeah, um, so we've officially changed our stance and now we want to be We never claim to be like a well-researched podcast, so. No, that's right. <laughs> I mean, the fact yeah. that we're even correcting it is, uh, that's growth. Yes. Um, what, what have you guys, what have y'all been up to? Saw Fast 10 and 4DX on Thursday. You saw it, you saw it four, 40 times or is... In 4DX. It's like when what you're in the you... chair and it's like just ragdolling you and stuff. It's squirting water in your face for some reason. Oh my God. Yeah, it uh, was... Yeah. What, what, all, what, were all, what is the plot of Fast 10, first of all? Um... So, like, are you guys up to date, or am I just yeah. a crazy person? Uh, just go ahead. Uh, okay, so, which is the one when they were in Brazil and they stole the uh, safe from the guy and they ran it through, like, the city center and, like, it, the safe eventually got weaponized and took out a bunch of people. Anyway, the guy who they killed, uh, his son's played by Jason Moma, who okay. puts in a fucking oscar worthy performance in this man he's like the sassiest villain i've ever seen in my life on the big screen on the silver screen but he's like a good actor yeah like yeah the costume designer went crazy on him and he had like the finest silks and shit <laughs> like the, the scrunchy game was impeccable <laughs> yeah but, and you um, saw it in 4dx what was the wettest scene like what scene did they employ the most to moisture for not the wettest, but the weirdest was definitely 
there was like leaking gasoline at one point and they sprayed us and i was like that's <laughs> all right that's, that's like really weird because they're implying like all right if you like surreptitiously light up a j in this movie theater you will just have a fucking you'll be like a one man zoolander scene <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, was, it was a it was a weird choice. <clears throat> uh, it was a weird choice at that part, but that would like that would have been cooler than if they made the wettest scene, like where someone took like, took their shirt off or something, and then they, then they sprayed you with water to imply that you were hit with like a bead of sweat. <laughs> that oh, that'd be gross. Yeah, that'd be worse like than that. the gasoline thing. Yeah, what I feel like. Want? I'm trying to think of any other group. Oh, I tried eating popcorn at one point and I got sprayed in the face. So oh, yeah. that was, yeah, that was fun. Um, also, when they're shooting guns, they have like these little puffer, like air puff things by your ear. And so you just like. Oh, really? That sounds like yeah. stressful. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for it the first time, but it was just like, all right. I see and so like every time they that. fire a gun, you feel like they're right behind you. Mm hmm. So America's great. This, so this movie is basically as close to like a theme park ride as you can get. Like I remember once I went to Universal Studios and they had an alien thing that was basically you just sat in a room and different things like touched you from your seat and like you got water sprayed on you and at some point like a fake tentacle came out and grabbed your leg or something. And it sounds like they've just ported this to movie theaters, like straight up. Yeah. I mean, they've done it with other movies before and like, you can still go see fast 10 in like a regular ass seat. If you want, if you don't want to have to deal with all that, but yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Like you're constantly paying attention to the movie. It helps with your focus. Cause you need to know like what side you're about to get like leaned over to and shit. Brace yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, your reflexes have to be on point while you're watching it, just to duck and dodge everything coming for oh, you. Oh yeah, I had my feet like planted firmly on like the rest they have on it, <laughs> just in case like for whatever reason, like they hit the brakes on screen and go through the windshield and like you're sent flying too. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I'm movies to are imagine. intense now. It's too much. How many movies do you guys see a year, like in cinema? One. Yeah, like four for me, maybe. I think I've seen like three so far this year. Yeah. Yeah, three or four. I want to start like the Oscar nominated shorts, the animated ones. Hmm. And the year's half yeah. over, so you'll probably end up seeing another three or four. So less than 10. I think everybody like watches less than 10 movies in theaters. I would probably... Well, I, yeah, I don't go like once a month or anything. I would probably watch a lot of movies if I lived in New York and had like access to like the film forum and IFC and those like weird, like indie, like 30 seat movie theaters in Brooklyn and shit. But I don't know. It's just like a big, it's a big fucking to do to go see a movie. Yeah. Like they're fun, but you got to commit time. And you know, sometimes <clears throat> I just want to get up and like go do something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the ability to pause stuff is underrated. That's the thing is like when I was in jail, we have HBO, we have all these channels, but we don't have them on demand. So you have to like block off time. You have to go to the bathroom on the half hour. You know, you, you take stuff like that for granted, for sure. What were like the big, what were the big jail shows besides the one that was a reality show about undercover boss in jail or whatever? Um the biggest show in jail was by far power and the power extended cinematic universe. Um, your honor was big. Um, Lovecraft country was a really big show. I don't know if you guys watched that. Jonathan majors was in it and Jesse Smollett's sister is also in it. Okay. Really good show, but pretty much anything that's on from HBO. Remember like the, the key time slot is, uh, was Thursday nights and Sunday nights. Um, mm -hmm. cause we had stars and the stars really went in on Thursday night. So, Power ended, then Book of Ghost, then Book of Tommy, and I think they're doing like a spinoff on Tariq now, but it's been a while since I watched it. BMF was big too. BMF was really good. Mm, 
So kind of like that. And then like everyone over 60 would just watch the History Channel and Na- National Geographic to find out like where Hitler like hit his coffee or whatever. <laughs> Did the white supremacists watch Yellowstone? We didn't have Yellowstone. That was like the one thing that we didn't have because that's Paramount, right? Anything that's yeah. streaming exclusive, we didn't get. Which is why like those guys are really feeling the effects of the writer's strike right now more than anybody else in this world. Oh, man. Because, like, late-night TV the for them is how they get their news. Mm. Well, I have, a, I have a, better, a better media appearance to tell you all about. On all right. Thursday, I was on a show called Second Amendment Radio in St. Louis. Pivot time, baby. Wait, which okay. one's the Second Amendment? Is that the gun that's one? That's the guns. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the gun one. one. <clears throat> they, my publicist did not tell me what the interview actually was he was just like 12 30 p.m on thursday drew talks to second amendment or not drew talks to kmox in st louis and they call me they bring me on the air and they're like hey you're on second amendment radio and i'm like oh your pr guy hates you your pr person hates you (laughs) now andrew's cool he's he's working um he's He's helping me get exposure. I mean, honestly, the Second Amendment guys were pretty good. They did they hadn't read the book because rarely a radio host reads the book, but they were at least down to be like, you know, golf can really be a helpful thing. And we feel the same way about <laughs> trap shooting. Uh it's very peaceful to go trap shooting. Um but then I kind of got in trouble with them because they were like, you once wrote something where you said you could beat Trump at golf. Do you believe that? And I was like, yeah, dude, Trump cheats at golf all the time. And they like, didn't believe me. (laughs) And then after they like got me off the air and I was still on the phone listening to the radio station, they were like, that was a lot of fun. We should have asked him about the 2020 election. And the implication seems to have been that they, that in their world, it is known that the election was stolen and that like Trump was cheated. You guys set up. I did. Um, But listen, man, it's, it's all about, you know, reaching new markets, reaching new target demos. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to move units here. I read online. What, so like Nerzy on what's that platform? Rumble this time yeah. next year. Yeah, okay. <laughs> next year, what do you yeah. mean? We've been uploading all our clips to Rumble this whole time. Uh, right. Only eight viewers because we're being silenced by big tech. But whatever. <laughs> yes. Oh but, wow! I went on Rumble.com just now. DJ Academics front page. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. doesn't he have? Okay. Good for him, man. No. There was. <laughs> no. <laughs> There was that defector article about how like a bunch of sort of the entrenched hip hop media people who are on like YouTube are becoming sort of right wing just because like there's an audience there. Mm -hmm. Um, Not sort of right wing. I mean, Adam 22 had Richard Spencer on no jumper. Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, there was a big thing after the Jamie Foxx uh, fake news went around, and this Instagram personality named Kev on stage did a whole expose about who owns like Rap TV and Daily Loud and all of these accounts that you constantly see on your timeline updating you about this stuff, which are like, they're not no jumper or academics, but they're like one tier below. And the people who run those probably have similar politics to. Uh, Adam 22 in that they're like both sides are yeah at best yeah. the both sides libertarianism is like very very like entrenched in like rap media also to change the subject did y'all see that B.O.B. of airplanes fame recently posted a picture of one of those Japanese uh, sex pillow things a waifu uh yeah it's like is like it a, is it the body pillow that you sleep with or it's like the uh pillow that has holes in it that you can fuck? yeah you're gonna yeah what 
What do you, a pillow that has holes in it? Yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to talk about like those like triangle shaped ones that they used to have in the back of Maxim magazine or whatever. Oh, the no, wedges. No. That's for having sex with a real woman. No, this is different. Okay. This is this was like a pillow that had like a woman knit turned around kind of like looking backwards on it, like yeah. printed on it and then a butt like raised out and he had like a drink in the butt. And the caption oh, was like, huh. this is where I'm putting my cognac now or whatever. Oh, okay. I need to see this. I'm not Googling this. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I do not need that in my history. You can also get mouse pads. So it's like for your wrist, but the breasts cup your wrist. All right. All right. We're, 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 I'm this not show happy started about off it. the rails. <laughs> Somebody's got to run this one. Yeah, we shouldn't talk about this unless we can plug it. Uh, I'm uh, trying to plug it. If you have my sense of the word plug, that's disgusting. The only thing that is really giving me like hope right now is watching Jimmy Butler. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You guys like that segue back to the outline? Yeah, I was about to say that was <laughs> the yeah, um, writer, baby. <laughs> did, did you guys watch you guys watch the last game and grant williams poke the bear right yes mm-hmm. did you see the tweet that came out that he was playing pokemon go before the game grant williams was yeah what and like he... on some hardcore shit because he was using two phones which you do when you're like really trying to grind so when was not a great game? look uh what's that what day was the game um uh, friday thursday i think I retweeted the uh, tweet about Grant Williams playing Pokemon Go. No, because I'm about to go into Pokemon Go and see if there was like a special event. No, there wasn't. <laughs> the special event was today from 2 to 5. Uh, I was out there grinding for it. That's how I know. Okay. What is? I still don't really understand what the point of Pokemon Go is. Like, are, It's a point of anything. You, you, you got to catch it? them all. No, you, well, you got to catch them all and then you like organize them. It's boring. We're not going to get into it right now. But it's just funny that Grant Williams, the, the guy who cost him the game, was doing something so benign. But yeah, man, I like, did you see the uh, the conspiracy theory that Jimmy Butler is actually Michael Jordan's child? Uh, is it a real conspiracy theory or? I mean, what do you, like, how would you define? Is it like something that has legs or is it just like one person on Twitter? Well, it's probably just one person on Twitter, but then the Joe Budden podcast mentioned it, so now it has legs. Okay, well, what is the case for Jimmy Butler being Michael Jordan's child? Okay, Uh, yeah, let's see. The Sporting News established 1886. Has something to say about it. Damn, 1886. That's a long time ago. They must know what they're talking about. Yeah, man. You don't stick around this long not telling the truth. (laughs) But yeah, what's the what's the case for Jimmy Butler being Michael Jordan's child? Is it just like Jimmy Butler, Michael Jordan's son? Jimmy Butler was raised. He was raised by his birth mom (laughs) until he was thirteen years old. (laughs) His mother claims that she she kicked him out of the house because the payments stopped coming in. Air quotes. There's rumors that Michael Jordan had a child outside of his marriage with another woman. And in order to preserve his marriage and his family, he made financial arrangements for 13 years with the other woman. 13 years. I mean, it sounds pretty airtight to me. So the argument is because Michael Jordan might have had an illegitimate child and that like Jimmy Butler has never publicly said the name of his dad and the timelines. One element of these two timelines may match up that this is, I I buy it. I mean, the way that Jimmy Butler's playing, it definitely reminds you of what people think Michael Jordan played. Like I never really watched Michael Jordan play, so I can't tell you, but (laughs) what Jimmy Butler's doing is like frustratingly impressive. It is, um, but also he's an NBA player who is playing well in a clutch situation. Over and over. But like, who else are you going to compare him to besides Michael Jordan if he's the best player on the court? <laughs> uh, Steph Curry. 
different yeah. different heights. Oh, uh, true. I mean, it's, I think it's just the fact that like it's um, it's almost malicious how much he enjoys it. Like it really just feels like he's getting off on just dominating the other team, and it's just frustrating too because this is the eighth seed. These people, these guys, were not even supposed to like make it into the playoffs, let alone into the finals. So people just. Uh, I think it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, the regular season like really doesn't matter. You just got to get to the playoffs. Yeah. That's really frustrating as a fan. As a fan of a team that didn't quite make the playoffs? Well, I'm not talking about me personally, but I'm talking about as a fan of anything, you're not even rooting for them to be really good anymore. You're just rooting for them to like pick it up uh, 90% of the way through the season and just get it together. It really yeah, like yeah, you want them to find that consistency, and you want them to get a feel of like what the other teams are doing in case you play them in the playoffs. Like when we say like the regular season doesn't matter, I'm not talking about like it's just do what you got to do to get to the playoffs. Even though it definitely sounded like I said that, but the regular season also presents a lot of opportunities, you know, for learning, for building consistency, yeah. for building that team camaraderie. And also, I think it just like, like really bind the boys together, you know. And also, it gives the fans time to uh, like pick the players that they really love and the ones that irrationally hate. Mm. Um, and like you know, you get to see the personalities. You get to uh, read a lot of debates on Reddit about like whether they should trade the biggest star that they've built the entire team around because they like lost one game by 20 points. Um, that's like a big part of basketball fandom now, I think is like just fucking around with those trade machines. Um, and then telling Reddit about it. It's been kind of a weird thing in sports in general though, because like it also happens in soccer where people seem to like look more forward to the off season and who they're going to bring into the team or get out of the team than they do, like, the actual league seasons. Yeah. Yeah, I've been seeing that a lot. People talking about how people don't even like the NBA. They just like the narratives. Because people are getting frustrated now by saying, like, oh, if Denver and Miami are going to be in the finals, nobody's going to watch it. But, like, objectively, it's going to be a good series because they're the two best teams in the NBA. But people don't care to watch good basketball. They care for, like, the narrative to continue. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I blame also, gambling. Well, yeah. Although I've lost like seven dollars on the playoffs so far, so I think I'm think I'm done. And I told Jeremy if the Sixers won game seven, he was gonna have to buy me a t shirt from him. But it didn't happen. Well, if the Celtics come back and win the series, I'm gonna watch the town. At least four times. I think you have to. Uh, Trey, have you heard about this? No, I have not. Um, So the coach of the Celtics, this guy Joe Mazzulla, is obsessed with the movie The Town and watches it like every day. (laughs) With the team. Yeah. And like... He just uh, he just loves this movie. He loves the direction, the very competent directing of Ben Affleck, his ability to produce a theater adequate film um, on time and on budget. And he likes that it takes place in Boston. And it's the only movie he can think of that takes place in Boston, evidently, because he doesn't know about like The Departed <laughs> or Spotlight, I'm guessing. Um Although Spotlight, that's really, that's not like a good movie if you're like a sports person, unless you're really into the sport of journalism. (laughs) There's a lot of fucking Boston movies here. Like, why didn't he? You got Moneyball. Boondock Saints, isn't that? That's Boston. Um, Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there's like a lot of movies. Aladdin, <laughs> sure. Um, I feel like there's like a lot of movies that like the white Boston rappers are in that are like sub, sub Affleck uh, gangster movies. 
Mm, uh, Tubi movies. Tubi? Yeah, like Tubi Originals. Um where like, yeah, all of the budget is just spent on like those like squibs that explode um on command. So you can shoot up a bar. Did you know Tubi's owned by Fox? Really? Yeah. Although this I might mean, have to be something we fact check next episode. I'm like 90% sure. They either no, own a majority. Right. It is. It they is. are owned by Tubi. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, fuck. Should have bought uh, Tubi instead of Vice. Yeah. Hey, do you watch any Tubi movies? Have you actually like sat down and been like, okay, let me see what the hype yeah, is about? Tubi has some absolutely insane shit on there. Really? And, yeah. Like the you, horror movies. There's one called Wolf Cop. Wolf like Cop? Some of my friends, Wolf Cop. Yeah, some of my friends put me onto it. Uh, for some reason, the Wolf Cop hangs dong in the what? movie. What? <clears throat> and that's like, yeah. What do you mean the Wolf Cop hangs dong? It, I didn't stutter. But what, what does that, that mean? Wolf Cop did. You just gonna have to catch the movie and see. Okay. Fair oh. enough. The transformation starts with a penis. What? I thought the transformation started with like a full moon, and that's when you became a werewolf. But I mean, I don't know. There's also another movie called like Four Mills vs Zombies. Okay, I, I can you explain the plot of that one? Again, it's Four Mills <laughs> vs Zombies. Like I don't, I don't know what you're looking for here. Um, I would say with the Tubi movies, though, like, they tell you what it's about. Like, there's yeah. no question once you hear the, uh... yeah, hold on, let me. Well, Fast X is just a Tubi movie with a bigger budget, right? Well, it's not just a film. It's a sensory experience. It's, <laughs> it's a parable uh, it's about a, family. No, it's a very exciting tale that touches on subjects such as a found family. Mm-hmm. You know, um... Yeah, how one can keep growing through age. Talks about mm -hmm. trauma, talks about loss. Talks about the power of the human mind and its capability for engineering and <laughs> doing science on the fly. Yeah. How did what, the Fast yeah. and Furious movies become like the main franchise besides like Marvel? Because, uh, because just, they are with us. Yeah. It's just wrestling, Fair the enough. movie. Yeah, the same reason wrestling is really popular. Do you think the, the results of the basketball game would have been different if they watched Fast anything, like Fast 9, Fast 8, instead of The Town? Because The Town is like, it's not a great movie. It's just set it off, right? I mean, like, if you're watching something every day for, like, weeks on end, it just kind of starts to lose its potency, you know? Or it just, like, embeds itself within you. So you just live your life by the principles as laid out to you in The Town. AKA Boston set it off. Yeah. I knew a kid in high school who watched Fight Club every day and he was like quote unquote troubled. And by What's that, he doing I now? Mean, oh, he's like uh a congressman. He's got like a PhD in archaeology or something. Um and he might be like a professor at NC State. So uh yeah, things really things really went downhill for him, you know. Uh, <laughs> if you watch Fight Club every day, you end up in the damn in the damn gutter of academia. He's probably like really active on 4chan, though. You know how like there's still people on there who are uh, writing long ass threads. Yeah, some of them are. Most of them are from the world of academia. I'm sure of it. Who else has the time? I I know one person or one person I went to college with is still very on 4chan and he has a zine about being a neat, which is oh. a person. What? I, well, you were about to answer my question. My bad. Oh no. Um, a neat is a person who is not in employment, education or training. And it's just like, the weirdest, darkest blog I have ever read. So someone who's um, unemployed. Yeah, but like but more. Sounds like. 
yeah, it's like willfully being like, you know, willfully not having a job and sort of like selling plasma in order to live in like a house that you share with 10 other men and you all sell plasma and eat beans and rice and play video games all day. It's like very, very dark. And he posts uh, on fortune <laughs> and like, he's yeah, believe it or not, believe it or not, this guy is on fortune. That's crazy. I bet you he's also on Twitter with like one of those Roman Greco Roman uh, avatars talking about how like masculinity is completely failing and uh, birth rates. I feel like so right. the West and that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely like, this is definitely like a fucking like statue, like marble statue head avatar have an ass guy. Where did that come from? Because like back in our day, we had our own Andrew Tate, but his name was Dane Cook, you know, mm-hmm. but but now it's like imbued with this whole like uh, red pill uh, ideology that didn't exist before. I mean, I think it comes from like the pickup artist thing, which sort of evolved into because it's like, okay, we're going to look at like dating as like an economic market. Right. And then if we're looking at dating as economic markets, then we're going to look at everything as economic markets. And it's like survival of the fittest and the society that like epitomized that is Rome. And so there you go. Um, uh, uh, Drew, would you not trade Joel Embiid for Wemby? Uh, no, dude, I would keep Wemby. I mean, I would keep Embiid. Um, he is, I don't, I'm not like a fan of the Sixers necessarily because I'm like, all right, I want to see them win a championship. I would like them to win a championship, but it's also like, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy like being fans of this group of people and their chemistry and watching their sort of like struggles and occasional triumphs, frequent triumphs in the uh, regular season, occasional triumphs in the playoffs. And I don't know, man, like I'm sure Wemby's great. He's probably going to kick ass, but yeah, it's like Embiid's the MVP. Why would you trade the MVP? You just do load management better next season and then he'll be better in the playoffs. Like it's it's fine. I hate load management. What if you what if you decide to go see a game next season and the game you decide to go to is the game and B takes off? Wouldn't you be upset? No, because then I get to watch an entire game of B ball Paul, <laughs> who is also, you know, he's the best t shirt salesman. He's the best of all t-shirt salesmen in the world, he is the best at basketball of them. That is cool. And he is also like a very chaotic player where he'll like, he's really good at getting rebounds and also really good at turning the ball over and thinks he can, and like, we'll do like behind the back dribbles that work like 25% of the time. He's really fun to watch. I would be fine with that. That sounds like a fan who they let play. Like just the way that you're describing this person. Um, Sounds like he won a contest to to be on the Philadelphia 76ers. He did win the contest. The contest was like, be the least bad of the three backup centers they signed. (laughs) And hopefully, yeah. So he did win a contest and like earn Doc Rivers' respect. That was the other part of the contest. Hmm. Well, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to that big French guy, Andrew Popovich, who uh, has a history of coaching the French to victories. I mean, is the is the lottery rigged? Like, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know how, but I know it is. Yeah. Well, there's like the frozen envelope theory. Yeah, I feel like they're not even trying to do that anymore. They're just straight up like, this is the storyline this year. Spurs need number one. Uh, We need to keep popping the league another five years. We're going to do that by telling him you can coach a generational player again, uh, but you just got to stay here for five more years. Just for the layman, 
I mean, I know the, the NBA draft, but when you say frozen envelope theory, is that like they they literally freeze the the team that they want to pick so that when they reach their hand in, it's cold to the touch? That is the theory. I forget. I think it was like when Ewing was coming into the league. Um, and like, I'm pretty sure it was Ewing and the Knicks. So we're just going to pretend it is. And if I'm wrong, the other, the greater contours are correct. But it was basically like, it would have been great for this huge market team to get a, to get the best player in the draft. And so allegedly they freeze an envelope that has the team's name in it. Cause you like stick your hand in a bag to pick the thing, or this is how it used to be. And apparently the commissioner, David Stern at the time, like kind of rummaged around, like he was trying to find the correct, perhaps correct temperature envelope. And then he pulls it out and it's like the big market team getting the best player. Yeah. The 1985 draft with Patrick Ewing. Okay. Yes. And like, obviously the Hornets were not going to get Wimby because like, they would have been really good if LaMelo had not been hurt. They would have won. Actually, yeah. Slava, you you texted me before the season and you were like, I think the Hornets are going to win it all. I really thought that the Hornets were going to be better. I knew that Cleveland was going to be better, but I feel like LaMelo just give him like a couple more weapons. Terry Rozier is his number two guy, right? So the second they get literally anyone else, I think it's going to be a really active off season though. I think there's going to be a lot of moves being made and the, the league is going to look drastically different to start the next season. I could see that. Um, also, uh, yeah, we just had, speaking of things in Philadelphia, we just had like three, a weekend where there were three Taylor Swift concerts and it was really weird to just like drive around and see people just wearing glitter and shit, just walking the streets. It was like, yeah. Yeah. It feels like she somehow became more popular than ever during the lockdown. How did that happen? I think part of it was like a correction on Kanye fandom. Mm. Some of it was just like people were in the house more just listening to goddamn Taylor Swift. <laughs> Cause that's definitely like, I know the algorithm was like, probably pumping her crazy on fucking Spotify or whatever. Mm. Yeah, it's... I had a weird night a few months ago where I ended up seeing Black Panther 2 and then listening to, like, half the Taylor Swift album at someone's house. So, like, that was... Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's a number of different things. Also, the Swifties are just getting older and smarter now. They might not know, like, new viral content tactics or some shit some of these swifties are going into the workplace a lot of them are <laughs> in, working in congress oh. right um i saw that there's like there is currently an attempt to educate and inform taylor swift about her toxic boyfriend the 1975 man is and this there's one like, who's kissing everybody at these shows and shit um maybe Probably. The reason he's problematic is because he appeared on this little show that used to be called Come Town and was now the Adam Friedland show. And they actually had to like take his appearance offline because it was uh, so controversial, even though he he just said some like edgelord shit about uh, watching ghetto gaggers. And people got really upset at that because Taylor Swift's fans didn't want to have to find out what ghetto gaggers was. He he did kiss fans too. I didn't know about this, mm-hmm. but I just googled it. And he did. He would kiss fans. He would French kiss them at his concert as like a bit. I guess that's a good bit. This does seem to be part <laughs> oh, of. The... Oh, it, it was a bit. Okay. Yeah. It's stri- it stri- it strictly for comedy, guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> that does. This does seem to fit into a larger thing where pop stars fans attempt to educate them about their boyfriends Hmm. like when lana del rey dated jack from salem there was like a big thing where the fans were like we need to let them know that jack from salem is bisexual and a known heroin user 
Oh yeah, I've seen pictures of this guy. He looks awesome. He... Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's good music. Yeah. yeah, Salem is. This is a pro Salem podcast. Um, I think it's safe to say. Well, let's let's do some research before we. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look into their politics. Um. Oh. Oh. Apparently, the they have these witch trials. You guys heard about the witch trials that this band put on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's the thing is Salem has Salem already has been subjected to one witch hunt, and now the Lana fans are doing another. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Wait, Slava, but, have you uh, ever listened to Salem? No. I, I thought, no. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to add it to my thing. I'm getting a lot of music recommendations from this podcast, but I can't keep up with all of them. So I'm going to add Salem to the list. Salem. Oh, all caps. Cool. Mm, I don't know. I think Taylor Swift's fans are just really annoying online personalities because all fandoms are annoying online. But uh, Taylor's are old enough to like not be um, like it's not endearing anymore. They're like very pointed and they like they know how to do petitions really good. So like mm-hmm. their their style of uh, caving for the artist is a little different. Dream chasers. <laughs> um, what is what is the thing that Taylor Swift like did? She defended a fan from aggressive security. Yeah, she oh, pulled no, an anti like Travis one thing. There's like a number of things Taylor Swift has done, like the way she structured her record contract to make sure. Like other artists on the label, or even too. Oh, really? Yeah, she's she. Fight, it took her like years, but like she spoke out against like that one guy who was president for a little while. Uh, you mean Trump? No, the other guy who was president for a little while. Biden. Obama. Obama. I'm yes, Trump. <laughs> Fuck. Um. Well, I thought you meant speaking out against Scooter Braun because I knew she did that. And I was like, the president of what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> no, nah, but um, she's like, she, she's proven time and time again to have like kind of clumsy politics, but there, she's her heart's in the right place, I guess. Fair. Who's like, who's like the most communist major star of any of like music or film and you can't just say rage against the machine. If you were like a true communist, you wouldn't be a musician. Yeah, you uh, would. You could be. Yeah. You think so? I don't, cause under you like real communism, the world, yeah. you, so you'd be some kind of like folk singer, I guess. Cause you're not making like uh hyper consumerist music, which is most music. I mean, I don't know, like the band Crass, they have like a, they had like a commune um, that people lived on. And like, I mean, it, it, it was like legitimately very cool that like Rage Against the Machine were like putting on for the Zapatistas, Neo Zapatistas in like Southern Mexico who just like have cordoned off a portion of that country and are like, yeah, this is our state now we have no leader and it's just like a giant like collective co-op thing um but i think the answer is probably danny devito because he really likes democracy now um maybe it's talib kwali i don't think (sighs) kwali is a well well, i guess like what's your argument there uh there's a, a thread on reddit our communism and it says best <laughs> communist rappers <laughs> and my eyes jumped to tell them quality because none of these other ones would really qualify killer mike i don't think so i mean he he was like he was like doing a lot of events with bernie yeah he's like really he's a big libertarian though or he likes guns that's like a and free speech yeah but like I, well, being on there, the there's and- that uh there's a few groups who claim to love guns and free speech nowadays, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like yeah, that 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 could be. We need a little bit more. Oh, what about Boots Riley? Does that count? I guess it does count because yeah, Boots Riley counts. Yeah, yeah, 
He's like kind of a tanky though, which is really funny. <laughs> what does that mean again? So like, you know Tiananmen Square? Heard of it. Uh, the tankies believe that the people in the tanks on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party were the righteous uh, side on that rather than the people who were getting run over by the tanks. Oh, okay. So you're just pro-tank. Um, well, you're like pro... You are caping for like authoritarian communist regimes or authoritarian regimes who operate under the guise of communism. It's like... It's like a weird look. It's also like really easy to get accused of being a tanky on Twitter, but I very vividly remember Boots Riley once arguing with people on Twitter being like, oh yeah, the Tiananmen Square thing, that was like paid protesters from the US. Uh, the CIA organized it. Ergo, they <laughs> should have gotten crushed by the tanks. It was like pretty fucked up. See, like these are the types of questions Taylor Swift's fans need to ask of her. Yes. Where does she come down on what happened at Tiananmen Square? Yeah, I'm saying Taylor is a tanky until proven otherwise. Mm, you heard it here. Remember first. that one Swifty who like tweeted about like being back on Twitter, and the other Swifties were like, "Where did you go?" And they said, uh, "I was thrown in jail because I refused to join the IDF." <laughs> <laughs> That's sick. Yes. I do remember. I remember that. That, that was really funny. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Taylor Swift. I I don't listen to any new music, but I mean, she might be kind of cool. If you have that, if that person is your fan, you're automatically cool. Yeah, we might have to do a little, uh, like how Pitchfork's going back and reevaluating all their reviews right now. That's yeah. Pitchfork, right? Yeah, we might have to yeah. go back and like reevaluate some peoples in general yeah um also speaking of which uh the weekend he's back he had a he had a cover story in the hollywood reporter that i didn't read that i'm hoping one of you one of y'all read i mean i didn't read uh, it but that's not going to stop me from talking about it i didn't read it but like the, the big news is uh the next album is going to be his last as the weekend um what does that mean? Like, is he going to stop making music or is he just going to be like, oh, I'm able now? I, yeah, I think he said like that could be like one of the options. But I think like to paraphrase him, he says something about he's told as much of the story of the weekend as he could. Or mm -hmm. like this like kind of active SO he's uh, created is like kind of just you can't take it any further. Which is weird, because, like, what is that story? It's a guy who likes to do drugs and have sex. And, like, was there some kind of larger... Like, was Don FM some kind of, like, narrative... Uh, narrative, like, American gangster, you know? Well, I think, it, like, right when uh, After Hours came out, he hinted that it was, like, the beginning of a... Or sometime between After Hours and Don FM, he hinted that, like, this was kind of a trilogy of sorts. Mm -hmm. so i guess like starting the story and ending the story with trilogies is kind of a cool little concept i like when he got the plastic surgery did he actually get plastic surgery or was that just like he just showed up in bandages well no he got it he looked like a cat after wait what yeah he got like it was all part of the rollout but covid stepped on it so him wearing a mask took on a whole different meaning from what he originally intended for it to mean but the um, whole idea was like he got into an accident and then he got his face wrapped up and then he emerged from the bandages with this like highly Hollywoodized uh, persona. Okay. I'm reading the Hollywood Reporter article now. I just, I'm just skimming it. And it's to do with that idol, the idol show that The Weeknd's on. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently Sam Levinson, the guy who wrote, who writes Euphoria, he moved in to The Weeknd's house for a month and that's how they produced this show the idol so they all live wow. together for a month i don't know that just seems like i thought i would note that that seems weird like it seems like a weird production 
schedule. That seems like I mean, someone who's a big fan of the weekend would be like, yo, you know how you're going to make this? I'm going to come and live with you. I'm going to go stay in your pool house for a month <laughs> yeah. for free, and we're going to make a TV show. Thirsty ass. <laughs> I mean, the weekend seems like an intense person <laughs> and like someone who probably doesn't actually do that many drugs and is instead like into like synths and shit because his like his like new collaborator guy for the past few years has been opn who's like the mr modular synth man he's just like a giant soundboard and what was that collab you had with like yeah gefilte fish the um, gif gestoffelstein that's it yeah i don't know what i don't know that they i don't know what that collaboration is but i i do know that that, yeah yeah Uh, you like to try yeah like honestly i was listening to dawn fm a lot over the past couple months for some reason and uh i think there's a pretty good shout for him being kind of like the best male pop star of his generation I think without a doubt, I think that my most controversial yeah. take is that he's the most successful Toronto musician to come out in the last 20 years. Um, but I think he's always kind of had that vision and like a very weird personal palette. Even like the first few albums, you know, uh, Susie and the Banshees was like a weird sample to kind of throw out there, but he made it work. Yeah, he makes some like really weird fucking choices that he can somehow make like appealing to the mainstream. That's why this whole thing is interesting for me, because if he feels like he can't do this as the weekend, he's about to do something really, really weird. That's kind of how I'm reading this. Oh, that, I hadn't even that hadn't even crossed my mind. OK. And where he's like, I don't want my fans to associate this. Yeah. Maybe he's just going to what if he just makes like a fucking acoustic folk album? See, I think he's going to do like Death Grip style horror core noise music, if anything. The weekend starts working with 60% homo. <laughs> it turns out 60% homo is the weekend. Like, that's what he's changing his name to. <laughs> that would be an incredible, incredible admin reveal. Um, I mean, yeah, when you put it that way, the weekend is probably, he's probably one of the better better pop guys um, you know when i knew he was out of here when taylor swift brought him out at one of her earlier shows when she was touring that um you know like um welcome to new york that song yeah she was doing the big tour around that and she would bring out a different pop star everywhere and she brought the weekend out at one point and i was like oh yeah this is it he's out of here but then a few weeks later she brought out fetty wop so I was yep. like, I don't know how to feel about that anymore. Dude, for a while, Fetty Wap was out of here, man. I love uh, Fetty Wap. Yeah, like he's that, fantastic. Yes, I don't like. Does anybody like know for sure what happened that kind of just like derailed his career? Because it was like it looked like he was like the next big thing. I actually read an interview with him a while ago where I think he said that he just like. One, he mismanaged his finances and was like supporting way too many people around him. And actually Taylor Swift, while he was like coming out and doing shows with her at one point was like, listen, Fetty Wap, we have to get your finances in order. (laughs) And was like, you need to stop subsidizing like half of the people in your fucking in Patterson, New Jersey. And he was like, damn, okay, I guess I better do that. But then I think he also, like, he just kept saying, he was, like, touring and promoting Trap Queen and trying to record a new album. And he said he, like, shouldn't have done all of those things at the same time and should have done them one at a time. And he felt like the quality of his work like suffered and then he got burnt out. And I think now, unfortunately, he's in jail because he was involved in like. Yeah, you're missing like a very integral part of the story. But yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's the reason he is not currently making music is because he was involved in like a thing where. Yeah. And 
he unfortunately, while awaiting trial, uh, went on IG Live and showed a gun in a threatening manner to like someone associated with the state's case, um, which is... So like the last person who should know you have a gun. Exactly. So it's like you're pointing it at them. Okay. And then yeah. recording that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that guy screenshotted, went immediately to the DA, and they were like, oh, this is, thank you. This is great. Um, so not yeah, the best move. His whole thing seems like he had he had trouble saying no to people which I feel like uh, got him in trouble financially early on and then kind of got him caught up in in some other stuff because it didn't turn out to be short for confetti wop, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's the other thing is like, it's kind of incredible that like the number one song in the world at a time was made by a guy whose name was a nickname for heroin or for fentanyl. Mm-hmm. Many such cases, you know. Such as? Yeah, what else? What else are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, literally any... Two more of these many such cases. Of, like, uh, the, the song name being called out, but there's a... ESTG and Future have a lot of, like, hit songs where ESTG is just instructing the listener to go and buy a brick of fentanyl if they want to make money. Like, that's why all these fentanyl raps right now are depressing because they're all dark and they're all just literally guys telling you, like, if you want to change your life, go and buy a brick of fentanyl. Doesn't matter how many people you hurt. It doesn't... None of this matters. You will make money. That's how I mean, trap I, music I, is. I was talking more so like the artist names, but like, yeah, that's a fair. Yeah. I thought Fetty meant money. So did I, I mean, but you learn something new every day. I learned this from Slava, who learned this, I think, in jail. Uh, what, the fact that Fetty is fentanyl? Yeah, I yeah. mean, they, they even uh, Jay-Z on that latest God Did feature on the Khaled song talks about how he went from serving Fetty to Fenty. Uh, I... the Rihanna brand. And I don't really feel like Jay-Z ever sold fentanyl. But again, like if you have that much liquid cash around you and you have people around that could like double money for you, I'm sure that, you know, well, I don't know. I thought that Jay-Z was just like implying that he invested heavily in like Purdue pharmaceuticals. Yeah, well, that's there is an interesting thing. Like, uh, remember, Activist was really big, and now no one talks about it. But Walk Hard is the brand now. What is Walk Hard? Is that like Lean? Yeah, it's the main manufacturer of Lean, but it's a, an Indian company that's been around from time. But they only really started getting shouted out recently. Um, that Money Bag Yo song, w- Wakisha, that yeah. started coming on the TV in jail, and no one knew what the hell that was until so someone looked it up. And yeah, Walk Hard, that's just like the name of the brand. I wouldn't be shocked to find out that they did like a branded play, some native advertising, and they like <laughs> got money bag yo to put their name in a in the, the the song title. Is this like is this one of those things where that you can order like off off the dark web and they mail it to you, or is it like do you still have to like have like a script and get it or what? Well, I don't know. But uh Well one. Sorry, I forgot. Well, I'm not, I assume that you're not a lean drinker, Slava, and no, have never been. I tried lean once in Australia because they still put it in their cough syrup there because they haven't gotten hip to it. So we tried it there and it just gave me a tummy ache. Um, okay. Um, well, what's everybody, what's everybody been eating lately? Let's do some food talk. Some some food talk. Yeah. Well, you know, soup season is coming to a close, but uh Of course. Been eating a lot of uh breakfast soups, aka uh cereal mm-hmm. lately, yeah. What yeah, what kind of cereals are we working with? Oh, the rotation's been so got some uh Honey bunches of oats with the almonds in it. Okay, good. And yeah, some uh, some golden crisp, which I feel keep, like is an extremely underrated cereal. Keep going. 
Yeah, some uh, some Cabin Crunch. Really? Yeah, get some of the. Uh, have you seen the Cinnamon Toast Crunch family recently? Uh, no, I have not. I oh have not man, they, oh they they they're on fire right now, man. They got like a churro, uh, what? Toast Crunch. They got like a goddamn uh, Dolce de Leche. What? Yeah, flavor. Yeah, dude. Yeah, they're going crazy over there at uh, CTC. Damn. When when you first said you were eating cereals, I thought that you were talking about like Whole Foods, like the hemp granola That's cereal. <laughs> what kind of milk do you drink with it? Do you just put normal milk or do you spice it up, get some soy, oat milk? Uh, I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't do the regular milk, but I will do a, we'll do oat milk. And then, uh, also, last time I got put onto macadamia nut milk. What? Huh. Yeah. That sounds yeah, incredibly man. bougie. Yeah, it's incredibly delicious. I like the high-low combo of a rare nut milk and then a mainstream cereal. Hey, man, it's, when I say balanced meal, I mean balanced meal. You know? <laughs> what did you do before <laughs> the oat milk? Where were you, a soy guy? Nah, I just eat that shit dry. You're just like I haven't been lactose intolerant my entire life. You would just raw dog the cereal. No, it was like some sometime around the pandemic. I just started like not being able to handle dairy. Did you get the vaccine? Really? All right, we're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but like yeah, this it was before I got vaxxed, by the way. Um, but yeah, just like it was hard for me to take dairy anymore, man. So I had to. Uh, just switch some things up, which included just like eating cereal dry or not eating it for a while. So yeah, the past few months I've been like rediscovering my relationship with, uh, you know, this very, very special division of breakfast food I've been eating my whole life. Are you eating it exclusively for breakfast or is it? Like oh no. A- Sometimes I just have like, if I'm doing work, I'll just have like a box next to me in the afternoon and just like, you know, a little snack. Some cereals are better than as snacks. Yeah. You know? I when like you eat that. it out of the box, do you use a spoon or a scoop or you just use your hands? No, I use my hands. It's my cereal. It's so, like, <laughs> your hands get so sticky. And then you wash them and then you go back for more cereal. And now your cereal gets a little, like, uh, wet, you know? It's not getting that sticky. Because, like, I'm not sweating while I eat cereal. Are you grabbing it by the finger full or the no, hand full? No, no, because I'm not a fucking animal either. But, like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> God damn. All right. <laughs> I didn't mean to assume. I, I get the box. I pour some in my hand and I toss it into my mouth. Like, you yeah. pour it into your hand. Interesting. Yeah. From yeah. the box. Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting. And once I get towards the end, I got crumbs. I just like fucking chug the box. You know? True. Yeah. That, yeah. I'm more of a direct pour type of fella. If I'm, if I'm consuming a snack, I'm not trying to have the snack touch my hands. Cause like, I don't know, like, I'm using a laptop. I'm that's right. You know, yeah. I just played basketball. I haven't had a chance to wash my hands yet. So like I'm not, if I were eating a snack, I would immediately I would just go boop, just turn the bag into a shoot. Okay. Well, that's what you do. That is that is what I do. <laughs> I mean, no, it's more sanitary. Uh, you know. Like, unlike Trey, I'm not having a bunch of hand sanitizer next to my cereal. Um, well, I'm not doing that. It's all wet wipes. Okay. Do you use wet wipes <laughs> between handfuls of cereal? God. Not, not between every single handful of cereal, man. But, like, yeah. Um, uh, Trey, do you know what a mukbang is? Yeah. How did you find out? Uh, Twitter. Have you watched any? Uh, not really. Like, it... it they're definitely fetish videos and they're not my fetish. So like, I don't really have a reason to watch them, but yeah. Drew, do you know what a mukbang is? No, I thought that it was a type of dish, but now that, now that I have just heard Trey describe them the way he has described them, I am deeply confused. (laughs) Um, a mukbang is a video of somebody eating a lot of food at once. Uh, but oh, more okay. often than not, that person is like a petite woman or female presenting individual. Okay. 
and they oh. go crazy with the food and it's almost like this asmr thing as well because you're listening to them eat it but it's also the visual that's, that's the excuse the perverts who watch them use to see like oh no it's just so relaxing and stuff it's like nah man you horny as hell yeah, yeah no, both this does sound like true. a this does sound like a, a thing for the horny rather than that's like the that's the fucking that's the economic uh, equation there. I also like how, like, as of right now, I'm the only person to not bring up some kink shit on the pod today. <laughs> um, well, it depends on how you want to look at the weekend. Um, that's sensual. That's not kinky. <laughs> that's just a very vanilla kink. It's like kissing on the mouth in missionary position. Right. That's my kink. I just like okay. how mukbangs existed. They came up in Korea originally, but it's like a very American idea. Like of uh, watching someone eat excessively or just a pretty girl uh filming herself eating a lot of McDonald's or whatever. Yeah, wait, wait, that... where are we going with this? Um well, you guys wanted to talk about Patreon tears, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, why is it why is it harder to participate in cereal season under Joe Biden's economy? Oh, because everything's going up, man. They were trying to charge me damn near seven dollars for a box of Captain Crunch the other day. Seven dollars for a box of Captain Crunch? Yeah. Have is there like equivalent is there an equivalent of the Captain Crunch in like the bag cereal on the bottom row? Uh not at my grocery store. Uh, mine doesn't have like the store brand cereals or whatever, because otherwise I'd have no problem like getting those. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Crunch. Or... What would Captain Crunch in like the no name cereal aisle be called? Colonel Chomp. Admiral, Admiral <laughs> Berries. <laughs> Officer Sergeant Snack. Officer Mush. Yeah. What? Sergeant Snack? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Snack. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the bag cereals, that's like, that's just value. Like, you're paying for a lot of cardboard there. And you're also paying for, you know, all of the R&D that went into engineering uh, the Captain Crunch robot as built by Boston Dynamics. My only thing about those bags is, like, they take up a lot of fridge room. Because I don't like having, like, just bags out open and shit in the pantry. Because, like, that's how, like, mice get in there. Or, like, you might get ants and shit. So if mm -hmm. it's a bread product, I usually seal it up and throw them in the fridge. Like if it's a loaf of bread or whatever, some, mm. yeah. So that's my only thing about them. Cause like that's at fair. first two, they don't really make like Ziploc bags that they could fit in. Once you like get your first bowl or whatever, you got to get like at least halfway down. That's true. Yeah. I had a roommate who would put like rubber bands around it any like bag of chips etc and it seems to be the most effective and economic way of sealing a bag of something because like you always got rubber bands around and it you know it works just as good as a damn clip and so i have also adopted this practice and i encourage all of our listeners to as well would you guys ever eat bugs like a bag of bugs that they were what like. What is this? What? Kind of like Captain Crunch, but it's crickets. No. I don't want to, but I will. Um, I, I had a grasshopper taco once at this place, and that was about like enough bug eating for me. Did it taste good? It was just like it was just some crispy fried grasshoppers or whatever, you know? Yeah. How, yeah, exactly. I'd eat the shit out of some bugs. I feel like we need to get uh, used to the future. And that's going to involve us eating bugs. And I feel like cereal is the easiest device to get someone to eat bugs because you just sugarcoat them and then cover I'm, them I'm in. Not, I'm not drinking no fucking... What if I could promise you bugs. Captain Crunch at $2 a box? It wouldn't be Captain Crunch. It'd be Captain Bugs. Like, <laughs> what are you... Cricket Crunch, yeah. I mean, how do you know that there's already not bugs in Captain Crunch? Because bugs are... They can, except for ants, 
uh, they can be flavorless and they can kind of, they're kind of like tempeh and that they can have like flavor injected into them. And how do we know that big cereal is not already putting bugs in our Captain Crunch? Because they haven't said shit. And so I'm not going to just assume there's bugs in my food unless like I have a reason to assume there's bugs in my food. Well, obviously you're not going to read about George Soros putting bugs in your food when you only read George Soros funded news. <laughs> nah. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, I you know they make I like cricket flour or something like that. Yeah, flour would be the easiest one, or just like a whey protein type of thing that already exists. Like my protein powder has uh, unconventional forms of protein in it. Don't some protein powders have like bones, like ground up bones? Yeah, but I do the vegan one, so I can't have that. Are bugs vegan? Yeah, for sure. They're not an animal. They're a bug. That's why people like eating the idea of eating bugs too, because diseases can't pass through them to humans. That, that because it's fair that bugs aren't considered animals. Well, fair to who? They like it that way. The bugs. <laughs> no, they like not being part of animals. What's so special about being an animal? Are, are the bugs still do that? Yeah. You read the notes from the last bug congress? <laughs> <laughs> bugs, it's they get to be their own special kind of thing. They're uh it starts with an E. I can't remember it. And extremely no. alive and therefore animals is no, they're what not the animals they're insects insects are not animals oh well, it's like the is... first the first thing that you search when you say insects are first thing that pops up on google insects are not oh god damn it, it says insects are animals but then but then yeah. shrimp and lobster those are bugs and those, those are count crustaceans as animals. yeah but those are crustaceans a lobster is a crustacean. I don't know about shrimps. I don't really know anything about shrimps other than that they are bugs that live in the water that we eat. And so if they're animals, like you're not eating shrimp, are you? Uh, no, I'm not. But that's because but they're eating... underwater. That's different. There's like an underwater provision to the vegan laws where if it's yeah underwater, it's like pescatarianism like with people could be vegetarian but still eat fish this is, specific... crickets can swim what the fuck crickets can't swim famously known for not being able to swim no if don't you google that just trust me why are you googling things you don't need to google everything i say uh, uh apparently we do <laughs> apparently we do <laughs> shrimp and crickets this should be the biggest takeaway from this episode of the <laughs> <laughs> I am actually genuinely fascinated by the fact that you that vegans can eat bugs. I would not have called that. I mean, oh, so is there like a size yeah. limit on the bug? Like, like is a cicada good to go? Do but you like know what I? Absolutely not. You know what I really thought was delicious growing up uh, watching. Uh, you guys remember the original Lion King? Yep. You remember the bugs that they eat. Like Timon and Pumbaa, like the big oh, ass yeah, like, red and yeah. blue bug. Man, I always thought that yeah. looked so good. I would eat something and, like that, like a big ass maggot, like the size of like my arm. I mean, wait, are mealworms? Is that just like a more, a more palatable name for a maggot? Yeah, exactly. I think so. Actually, you know what? Let's just go with yes. No, it's different. Mealworms are different than maggots. Okay. Because mealworms are like... Meal they're like the main... Be they become beetles. Okay. They're like the main base food for like... If you're eating like a bug-based burger. The old triple B. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the ways that they will trick people into thinking something is meat is by actually using mushrooms... And like manipulating mushrooms to be a little bit more fleshy, uh, like beef would mm. be. Uh, the country that's like leading the way in all of this is Singapore. Singapore is killing it with their vegan and vegetarian options. Although oh, yeah. to make mushrooms have been going crazy the past few years, man. What has mushrooms have been going crazy the past few years? They're doing I like remember that Brussels sprout revolution that happened like a decade ago almost now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mushrooms like there's a this one restaurant, Kings County Imperial. 
where uh, they have uh, the deep fried oyster mushrooms, which is borderline just like popcorn chicken, and it's delicious. Wow. And then they also have uh, the mock eel, where they make like, I forget what kind of mushroom it is. It might be shiitake, but uh, they basically turn it like the consistency of eel and make it taste like barbecue eel. Wow. And eels are like, we're running out of eels on earth. Yeah. So this is actually a, a public time, service. Man. Yeah. 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 We get some lion's mane and shit. Fry that oh shit God. up like a beef. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah, man. Lion's mane is good. Um, I've definitely had, uh, I've definitely, my friend once made me mushrooms that he had foraged for breakfast. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? It was like a new category of flavor. It was really, really nice. Have y'all uh, ever got those Instagram ads for the like mushroom kits that you could have in your house? And so you just have unlimited mushrooms for the rest of your life. Oh, wow. Um, I thought those were for children. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of adults using them in uh, these commercials, all I'm going to say. All right. Yeah. Yeah, in the future, we're all eating mushrooms and, and insects. And nah, you know, I'm going I'm to eat, eat some of that Beyond Meat still. As long as they don't start putting beetles in or whatever the fuck. <laughs> I'm also still just going to eat meat. Like, we're not running out of chickens. Yeah, although sometimes we are. Like, they're artificial chickens. scarcity. Well, it was no, it was real scarcity. Scarcity made by avian flu over the winter, right? Or like at some point oh, in the yeah, last. That, oh yeah, that was a thing, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, there was like a chicken wing shortage, and chicken. Dude, there's wing... always a fucking chicken wing shortage, man. Is it because people just like chicken wings too much? Look, all I know is that goddamn, it costs you like $18 for like 10 to a dozen in New York City. What? Oh, yeah, they do. Chicken wing prices in New York are like a dollar plus per. Per pound, piece. right? Is that how you guys measure No, them? no, per, per individual piece of chicken if you go to a restaurant. It's outside okay. Outside of a place like Wingstop or something, like if you go to a restaurant and they have like their Chipotle wings or whatever. That's just gonna cost you like a dollar plus per wing. Per, per wing, it's like the best wing deals in the best wing deals in Brooklyn, at least I'll say, is like either Wingstop, like a carryout where you they say like five wings on it, but it's like five whole wings. So like, yeah, and I like eating the tips too. So like, whatever. And then mm-hmm. goddamn Popeyes has the six for five dollar ghost pepper wings right now. But like okay. those are the only ways to get like reasonably priced wings. Like, oh, would let you, me, would let you support right now. a Trey? Would you support a an initiative to genetically engineer chickens with four wings so we could double America's wings? No, I don't know. Okay, thank you. That's that was right. that was a trap question, not even a trick question. Uh, I. I don't eat chickens. I believe that chickens are tight and are. Wait, oh, yeah, we friends. talked about this one. Yeah. Yeah, but it's so. like, I don't know what's going on, man. Like a McDonald's hash brown costs about two fifty now. What? Really? That's crazy, too, because if you go to yeah. a McDonald's, you don't even talk to another human being. You just kind of like press a big ass phone until you get your food. Yeah, hold on. What's the McDonald's by me charging for hash browns right now? You got the app on your phone? Hell yeah, I got the app on my phone, man. Oh, that's how they get you. <laughs> you get push notifications for lunchtime Dude, shit. Okay, no, they're just giving out points, man. Like, you get a fucking value meal, and the next thing you know, you've already qualified for, like, a free McChicken. <laughs> you you get a two-night stay at the Ronald McDonald house. Yeah, and the deals are crazy, too. Uh, by the way, this is not an ad. If it was an ad, I would not be eating it right now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the deals, man, you just get like a free double cheeseburger when you buy one. What? Buy one breakfast sandwich, get one for a dollar. Yeah. Oh, one of the deals is one dollar hash browns. Okay, here we go. No, I'm doing it more. Which should just be the norm. The fact that now that's a deal that you have to unlock, that's fucked up. Yeah, Yeah. it's. 
five dollar twenty piece chicken nuggets, one dollar any size soft drink. Yeah, man, like you got to get the McDonald's up. A few weeks ago, they were goddamn. Uh, they had an in-app promotion where you can get the Big Mac sauce in the little uh, sauce containers, but you can only get them if you ordered off the app. Oh my god! All right, we. I'm. I'm calling it right now. We need to shut down the McDonald's app until we figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah, we're gonna do that by flooding it. Everybody, go download the McDonald's app. Yeah, I, I feel like the show will be good for at least like ten downloads. <laughs> uh, yo, no conversion rates are really hard. Um, apparently, you What's have to have wings for wings right now. Hold on. <laughs> Keep talking. I'm yeah. A pound of wings right. in Canada costs like sixteen to twenty bucks. Okay. But uh How much, yeah. Canadian or American? Or is it one to one? Uh no, it's like one to one point three. So like seventy five cents American is worth a Canadian dollar. Is everything higher priced in Canada or that's what people who come from America tell me. Yeah. Like everything is okay. like thirty twenty five to thirty percent more expensive here. But they go to like the designer boutiques, right? So they're like, oh, the Stone Island costs more than it does in the States. Oh, food's, food's cheaper. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Mm. You said $5 for 20 nuggets. We definitely don't have that. Okay. So real quick. Uh, well, that was just a deal. Like 20 nuggets any other day. <laughs> gonna be like a digit. Yeah. But okay. So Wingstop app has a wing calculator. Trey, how okay. many food apps do you have on your phone? That's not what we're talking about right now. <laughs> um, okay, so there's four of us, and would you say we're feeling snacky, hungry, or starving? Starving. Starving. Um, the fact that they give you that as an option is crazy. Are you snacky. literally starving right now? Like, click starving well, to middle. qualify we're, for we're, the best deal. We're we're hungry. Let's just do this in the middle. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so they recommend the forty piece group pack. Right. How much is a 40 piece group pack? About to find that out. Okay. Uh, Jesus well, they Christ. They don't just give you the, the price up front. Hey, eh? you got to like pay a deposit, then you go into another <laughs> room. Uh, so, classic I've seen wings. This before. Classic wings, it's $63.99. Okay. But it also comes with a large fries and two things of a. Uh, what's the crudite? Uh, you mean like <coughs> celery and carrots? Yeah. So for 40 uh, people, you get one large fry? Or yeah, 44 people. <laughs> but it's a 40 wing combo, which works out for $63. That's like $1.60 a wing. That's not bad. You got to do the per, per unit price like Costco. Yeah. Um, Costco is the best, man. Costco has the best golf ball deals they just like ripped off a few years ago the titleist pro v1 which is like the denali of golf balls and they sell it for like 25 percent less maybe half price compared to the good golf the like full price titleist um and so yeah a big part of being a golfer is like buying costco golf balls that's it because with their return policy you could just like bring them back at any time oh really yeah they have the most amazing return policy you don't even need to keep your receipt i'm on my third air fryer so if i can just find a dozen costco golf balls on the golf course and bring them back just like in a grocery bag to costco they'll give me what well, they'll give you them like as long as you have it on your Costco card that you have bought golf balls in the past. You could just be like, "Yeah, these don't work anymore," and they have to take them back. And how, give you, how does a golf ball not work anymore? That oh. hopefully they don't ask that many questions at the Costco return department. I can actually answer this question. If it gets a like tear on the cover from being hit with like a wedge, uh, which have like grooves that will sometimes cut the cover of a golf ball, it will no longer fly accurately because 
there's like a new element of the surface of the ball as it's like spinning in the air and it gets like blown or to like go in like a crazy direction. Um, also some golf balls manufacturer tolerance is very low and you'll just get like a golf ball that's shaped more like an egg than it should be. And that's bad. Yeah. You want to have a round ball (laughs) so that it doesn't like bounce in a weird direction. Um, also if a ball like gets waterlogged, like if it, if it's like soaking, if it's sitting in a pond for like a week, it'll take on water and it won't go as far, which I only recently found out. And I can't tell which of the golf balls that I have. I like fished out of a lake. Um, other ways that a golf ball, uh, so driving range balls are like super cheap quality and they will have, they'll just like, sort of split in two there'll just be like a bit hanging off of it and they're really fun to hit though because they'll go in like one direction and then the neck then the other direction um like it'll go left and then suddenly like fade right it's really fun does anybody ever like hit a golf ball so hard that the casing comes off and shit midair like when uh (coughs) when danny hit that uh one at bat in the sandlot and had to go get a new ball. (laughs) Um, Oh, not Danny Benny. Yeah. Anime style. Has anyone ever hit a ball anime style? No, but, uh, the, the pros will hit a golf ball so hard that it like goes from like circular to like oval and then bounces back. And like, a golf ball can crack if you accidentally like hit it really high and then it lands directly on like a like asphalt cart path. That's kind of rough. Hmm. Um, but yeah, golf balls generally very tough. Um, you can use them for years. People say there's a big difference between golf balls, but there's fucking not, you gotta be so good at golf to tell a difference between a golf ball. Cause if you're not good at golf, you don't know what the hell the ball is going to do it's going to do a bunch of different crazy things anyway. And like, if you're like, Oh, I got a bad golf ball, then you're just like blaming your shit on your fucking equipment and not yourself and not taking ownership and accountability, which is what we do here on Nersey. Yeah. Speaking of things that, uh, crack under pressure, did you guys hear that new Cuddy song? Um, no. What's the, what's the deal with it? I think I have that clip. I think I can pull that up. Run it back. Select Wait, oh shit, now I'm under pressure. Okay. They should have made a promise this early. It's a vamp for me to... Okay, I got. I have the clip. So this is... Kid Cudi, only... famously with haircut, yeah. uh, released a song, and people didn't like it, but I think it's pretty good. All right, this better fucking work. All right, this is the clip. Uh, hello, everyone. This is John, uh, at online present on Twitter. If you want to hear the clip of Kid Cudi's leaked song, I'll post it there. Um, this is not the Kid Cudi song, by the way. This song, I found this on YouTube under 80s retro stock music. Um, Kid Cudi has unfortunately told us that if we play his uh, leaked song, he will sue Nerzy. Um, but actually, the, the whole episode probably will get taken down, so... Sorry about that. I think we could, I think we've heard enough. It goes on. Like, yeah. Do you want to put the part where he goes rage, rage? Yeah, I, don't, I, I think we got the gist. I yeah, think it's I'm, sick. It just sounds. This is just. This is just a major laser song, um, and the fact that it it's a new song is not good. I don't like I don't like the fact that it sounds new, but it also sounds old. I like new things that sound new, like sixty percent homo. <laughs> I mean, this is just this is ripe for someone like sixty percent homo to come through and sample it and make it much better. Yes, dude. Yeah, the yeah, I don't have any opinion of that song at all. 
Well, I... um, you guys, the, the actual news story around the song was that he posted the snippet online and he was like, all right, fans, what you guys think about this? And people flamed him so hard that he announced that he's no longer, that's no longer the single. Because that was going to be really? the single off his own. Ah, stand up. Stand up for yourself. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about it. He didn't say it's not on the album. He just said it's not the single. And I was trying to pull that clip to, to play it on this show, and I couldn't find a single version because he's DMCA'd every single like tweet that includes it. I had to actually look quite hard to find that one, like the one thing online that still has this. If we post this, he'll probably DMCA our podcast. Then why um, did we play it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you get six seconds? We can just do six seconds. We can cut that. That's not hard and fast. It's up to the artist. If the artist wants to be a dickhead, they could be. Um, That's for the Patreon. We'll just yeah. have to, when we talk about it on socials, we'll just do Kid Cuddy, like two T's. <laughs> that way he can't, it will show up in his name search. I'll pitch shift it. Yeah, or chip like, that shit. It might sound good accidentally could- if you do that. We could just play like and screw it or whatever. Like, well, can you imagine John actually made it sound good? I mean, you seem to like it. Like you were I dancing. Yeah, I feel like the fact that people hate it makes me love it, and mm-hmm. for no other reason. That's what music's all about. It's all about eliciting emotion in people. That's true. Yeah, I don't think I have a one unit of emotion for that song. Like it's. It sounds very, very like familiar. Yeah, and I guess that, that's and, yeah. and that's something that was like it was familiar because it impressed me and it stuck with me. It's familiar because like I know I'm, I've heard this in the CBS before. <laughs> you know, it kind of reminds me of when Kevin Federline made a rap album. All right, was it good? Uh. <laughs> No, but what's weird is the main producer on it was this guy named Disco D who made the 50 Cent song Ski Mask Way, which is like the best beat of all time. Um, And somehow like Kevin Federline was like, all right, Disco D, just make me an album. And he was like, all right, I'm going to experiment with all of these different styles and it's going to be really cool and kevin federline just could not rap very well um guess how many monthly listeners kevin federline has on spotify i'm gonna say a thousand um between those two numbers between trey seven and actually you know what uh 923 wow how many songs did kevin federline release three wait one but it's the main, the acapella, and the instrumental. He made a he made an entire album. It's called Playing with Fire. And the cover is him in like a dress shirt, uh, with like holding cards in his hand, sort of like playing with them, not necessarily shuffling or holding them as if he's about to do poker or whatever. And there's like fire. Uh, coming either out of his hands or the playing cards themselves. It's a very okay, literal well, cover. That, that album is not on Spotify. Yeah, not on streaming. <laughs> it's a song called Popo Zao. Yeah, that's the Brazilian one. Like, Disco D got Kevin Federline making Baile Funk before Diplo ever heard of Baile Funk. Uh, it's not a good song, but it is notable that... <laughs> Kevin Federline sort of made a Baile Funk song. Uh, which would then be interpolated by Kid Cudi in the year 2023. Yes. And yes, that is the song that that song, that Kid Cudi song reminds me of. So um, we're, we're down on Cudi then? I, I'm neutral on Cudi. He's like a thing that people like. Um, <laughs> so you don't want to share your opinion lest, lest his Swifties come for you no he's also a thing that like a lot of people like a lot so yeah. he's one of those people who like people will unironically scream like kid Cuddy saved my life man yeah <laughs> yeah and it's like I, I, okay alright yeah. man I don't, I don't, I don't 
know how he did that, but I guess you owe Cody one, huh? Yeah, I mean, no, it's like the same. People also say that about Logic, and like, well, that's because so he has a song like, that's like an instruction manual on what to do if you ever feel like ending it all. <laughs> so he literally did save someone's life. Fair, but I also think that Logic just sort of he that song was maybe a consequence of the fact that his fans have this reaction to him. <laughs> so like he had to put out a song for like his fans because he was getting the vibe that they needed. Or it. like, or like, it's like a, it's like a response, like, you know, it's a response to greater market conditions. Like Captain Crunch sees that churros are trendy, so they put churro Captain Crunch out or cinnamon toast crunch or whatever. Um, and Logic is hearing people be like, "Man, your music really helps me with my anxiety and depression." And so he's like, "Ah, yes, my market, the market that I make my music for, that consumes my music, uh, will enjoy this song about the hotline thing." Yeah, that's probably true of all fans who are smart and savvy. You know, Taylor Swift probably does the same thing when she recalibrates her politics based on what her fans uh, likely trend towards, right? I guess that's just part of being an artist nowadays is like constantly being uh, malleable. Um, I don't know, man. Like Lana Del Rey knew what her fans were like and still decided to go date a cop. So, (laughs) Yeah. Lana... But also, like, being, like, sort of a Republican is very, like, in keeping with Lana's larger artistic image, I feel like, which is, like, Americana. Oh, yeah, just conserving what this great nation once was or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Taylor Swift is definitely to the left of Lana's politics. Yeah, but Lana also, Lana is a very closed circuit. You know what I mean? Like, she's not, like, she's leaving a lot open to interpretation, whereas Taylor Swift is like, here is who I am. This is the thing that I am about. I am Mm -hmm. genuine. Mm -hmm. But Lana's just like, I'm going to very sweetly sing, like, I... Uh, let's cut this part. Um, like it's kind of like her, that thing with the the weekend is or whatever. Like this is a character. You know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like what the main idea or like the metaphor you're trying to communicate. I guess with time that might become apparent or whatever. But like, yeah. It it just feels like we've been waiting for like the and now what part of Lana's thing, you know? Yeah. Where it's like, Although, okay, you're, you're definitely doing this thing. Why? Yeah. And we're still waiting on why in a way, you know? Um, That's what I appreciate about Insane Clown Posse is like <laughs> okay, 25 years into their run, they were like, okay, you guys were waiting for the why? It's God, baby. <laughs> the most insane God. clown of them all. I really want to go to, to that... Um, festival they have what's the name of the oh festival? the gathering, gathering of the I, I want to one day kind of go to the gathering of the juggalos just to see what's going on there oh god oh, it's crazy uh, yeah the the juggalos were the first ones to be like you know i don't know about that tequila uh, tequila tequila yep yeah they were the first ones and then like next thing you know she's out here proud boring it up and shit yeah i actually have a friend who is a rapper named ouija mac who was on psychopathic records and is now he's now like doing his own thing but he is still very juggalo affiliated but he's also like a vegan and drives a tesla i mean i guess a lot of rappers drive teslas but he's like sort of like the hipster connoisseurs juggalo rapper choice he's super tight does he have face tattoos uh, yeah, he has tattoos that kind of look like eyebrows under his eyes. And one of the things that he does in his music video or in his music videos is 
the camera will start and you think you're looking at his head right side up, but you're actually looking at his like fake eyebrow tattoos and the camera zooms out and turns over. And then you're like, damn, Ouija was upside down the whole time. We need to get him on the pod. Yeah, well, he's on tour right now. Ouija Mac. Yeah, like Ouija board and then oh. M-A-C-C. Uh, that's a really hard word to spell. He just, uh, I'm really happy for him. He just, he's done like music with Picture Plane. Um, and he just did a full album with Ricky Hill, which I mean, oh it's a God, great Ricky look Hill for him. is still making music? Yeah, he's still really popular. Ricky Hill, like uh, Tommy Hilfiger's son, who collaborated with The Weeknd early on. Yes. Really? Yeah. Good for him. Shout out to Ricky Hill. Hopefully you work with Taylor Swift one day. Yeah, he's turning that way. Um, But yeah, I'm sure we could get Ouija on. He's on tour right now, but he's super tight. Um, He's a lot of fun. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty good spot to to end it on. Yeah. Okay, Drew. uh, Drew, since you did the goddamn uh, intro, you want to do the outro? Yeah. Um, All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Um, this has been Nerzy, the only podcast that is brave enough to say that Taylor Swift might actually be kind of tight. Um, I am Drew, and with me has been dot 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 Slava Pastuk, Trey. Don't and worry John. about my last name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no one. No one, no one knows your last name. No one knows my last name either. And that's the way we want to keep it. <laughs>